Welcome back, everybody. Um, so uh, I will answer uh, some questions that you had during the break. But first, I, I want to ask you, can you raise your hand if you found XML namespaces complicated? You didn't find them complicated. That's the first year that this ever happens. So, so who finds them simple? Okay, now you find uh, them neither few, simple nor complicated. A few yeah. hands in the lecture hall. So was it more for simple or more for uh, complicated? On more the simple, simple side. Oh, this is awesome. Th then it means I explained it in an understandable way, understandable way, because usually it's considered very complicated. And in fact, this is why in the JSON community, a lot of people don't even want to hear about namespaces, right? Uh, all right, but then I'm absolutely delighted if you understood namespaces, that's absolutely great. So in practice, what are the namespaces? Well, this is whatever uh, conventions there are. For example, there is a namespace for mathematics formulas. That's the MathML namespace. Uh, there is a namespace for the tax certificates. They also came up with their own namespace. Typically, you use a domain that, uh, that, uh, that you own. Uh, what else is there? There is a namespace for music sheets. You can actually encode music in XML, and there is a namespace uh, for that as well. Uh, uh, th th there is a namespace for HTML, obviously, XHTML. There's also a namespace for that. Uh, so there's hundreds and hundreds of namespaces in the world. And these are every time there is a standard uh, for an XML data set to do this or that, then typically there is also a namespace uh, for the data set. So now you know if, if I give you, for example, an enormous um, uh, uh, database, let, let's say all the logs of a company, that, that is a huge mixture of music and and and, and uh, html and mathematics and so on but all mixed up in an enormous uh, uh, xml uh, uh, file uh, repository then thanks to namespaces just looking at a tag you know what that is you know that this is for example a g note of a music sheet or this is an equality in a mathematics formula or uh, this is a, a, a an AHAFA number of somebody in a, in a tax certificate and so on so this is uh, this is uh, what namespaces are for. Uh, uh, it's uh, wonderful to basically uh, tidy things. Um, okay, we had one question, I think, before the break on XML. Uh, yes. So the question is: Is XML case sensitive? Yes, it is. XML is case sensitive, and so is JSON, by the way. It's it's all case sensitive. So if you have an uppercase S or a lowercase F, that's different. These are different. Uh, um, uh, different names, basically. And that's both for the prefix and for the local name and also for the... Oh, then I was about to say for the namespace, it might be that for namespaces, there is a bit of uh, leniency, but I, I would still say it's also a uh, case sensitive for the namespace. The, the reason I'm thinking that is that when you type in your browser, the domain is actually not case sensitive. Only the path after the domain is. But if you try, let's try to type ethg.ch with the uppercase E, that will work too, normally. Uh, but, but after the first slash, then everything is case sensitive. All right. Any more questions? Anything else? No questions? You understood everything? From X7 and Jason. Okay. Well, if you have questions later, you can see us then later. So where are we now? Uh, we know how to store data. So of course you can store it on your laptop, but now you also know how to store data in the cloud with uh, Amazon S3, with Azure Blob Storage. Uh, Google also has a storage service that is similar. So you know how, where to store data. In HDFS, maybe you prefer to have your own HDFS cluster and store your data there. Petabytes of data. You can store in that way, like an enormous number of files, uh, also gigantic files and so on. So you know how to do that. Second, you know what to store now, because I showed you, so CSV you already knew, so you, you can store tables using the comma separated values. But now you know, also know how you can store nested data, like tables in tables as XML or in J as JSON, right? So you know two syntaxes for doing that. Uh, a second way to start a troll, there is one way to start a troll by asking, are elements better than attributes? The second way to start a troll on an XML forum is to ask, uh, is JSON better than XML? 
and then you can expect an avalanche of uh, of of uh, of, uh, of uh, people discussing uh, uh, whether JSON or XML is better. So. Um, you don't have to try it. I don't encourage you to try that. But if you Google around, you will see a lot of trolls uh, and discussions on that topic. But you, as ETH students, what you need to know is that there is no right answer to everything. It always, always, always depends on your use case, what you want to do, what the data looks like. Is it more like uh, blog posts and papers? Is it more like structured data? Is it nested? Is it not nested? You basically, just must be able to make your decision every time and the goal of that course is to make sure that you have all the information you need in order to make these decisions and in order to figure out what format is best for you. We will see in the future that there's alternatives to XML and JSON that are even much more compact and efficient, uh, but this is something we do in, uh, in uh, two weeks from now uh, so that you can uh, you will have other solutions for storing your data sets. I'll even show you, how, we will even show you how to convert uh, to these more efficient uh, uh, solutions later, so you have everything we need. All right, but right now we are going to take a small parenthesis from nested data. Right, so we, we looked at denormalized data. Let's get back to tables for a, for a moment. So we are here in the technology stack, right? Storage with its syntax, and now we are going to start uh, looking. I might ask questions maybe at the end uh, uh, at data models, right? So. I'm going to start the data modeling with tables just because it's easier to, to talk about tables. And then we'll worry again about trees and nested data next week when we look into the data models for uh, XML and JSON. But for today, just tables, right? The good old tables. So uh, you might know if you've been in the information systems for engineer lecture or if you've done your SQL brush up in the first week. Uh, that you have these traditional database management systems uh, as SQL databases with the SQL language that are able to store tables locally on one single machine. So this is small scale, maybe a megabytes or one gigabyte of data, maybe a terabyte if you push it to the boundaries of one machine. But this is typically small scale, right? It's not for huge databases. It's really what fits on your machine, right? And it was designed for one machine, uh, this, uh, these databases. Can we fix it to scale up? to scale up, for example, the number of records. Because if you're in a single machine, maybe you're going to be able to handle millions of records. You might be able to push it to the billion. Uh, if you know how to build the indices and so on, maybe you push it to the billion. But beyond the billion, you will see that you are hitting the limits. So what happens if you have 10 billion records or 100 billion records, a trillion records? Right? How, how do we scale that up? How do we even make it work? So I use the word up because here I'm talking on the logical level of the size of the record. So the distinction between scale up and scale out, right? So can we also scale up physically by just using a bigger hard drive or using more memory or a faster CPU and so on? Well, no, uh, because maybe you are going to go from 1 billion to 2 billion with a lot of efforts, but that doesn't bring you to 100 billion. Right? You, you would have to have a, a a disk that does not even exist yet today, if you want to fit 100 billion records on your machine. So we cannot do that. But we saw in the HDFS lecture that there is a way that we are able to store data across machines, right? And that's what we call scaling out, right? So you can scale out by just having plenty of machines. And then maybe you could think, okay, why don't we reuse the same techniques we saw uh, with HDFS? What did we see with HDFS? Well, we saw that you can partition the data uh, there's another word for it is blocks, chunks, shards, splits, whatever you want to call it. So you can just partition the data and nicely spread it over the machines. If you want to be extra safe, you can even replicate these shards, store them three times, each one of them, and spread it over machines. So one way would be to try to scale it out in that way. In the very early days of, of, of big data, so in the 2000s, the first, the pioneers of that, what they tried to do is they try to install a relational database management software like MySQL or you know, something like that on let's say 100 machines. So each machine has MySQL and then they store the tables, they shard manually the tables and store the tables on each one of the machines. But the machines just run standard relational database management software. And the engineers who did that wrote some glue to, to basically glue the machines together and then provide the front end that hides these 100 machines and then tries to redirect the request to the machines and so on, replicate and so on. 
they very quickly notice that it doesn't quite work, or at least that it's very cumbersome to do and very expensive. And that basically means we've reached the limits uh, of, of what good old relational database management systems can do. We need to find a better way to scale out. It means we need to completely uh, start from scratch everything and redesign a completely new system that is going to be able to handle multiple machines. All right. So this is the motivation for today's lecture. We need a completely new design in order to store hundreds of billions uh, of rows. Right. Okay. So. Uh, that's what I just said. It's very hard to do. It can become very costly. You also need a lot of a, a whole maintenance team, you know, to handle when there is a machine that crashes and so on. I mean, it's uh, very, very costly to maintain. So this new design now that we are going to uh, look into today, it's actually called HBase. H is the same H as in HGFS, by the way, it's for Hadoop, you know, the elephant toy of dog cutting, the yellow elephant. So HBase. Uh, and what we do is that we have a completely new design that is, of course, based on shards because we love shards in big data. So we nicely shard and we store on top of a cluster of machines. And guess what? Because we love we're using things in computer science, this cluster of machines, the, you, you know, that the, the data needs to be stored somewhere. Well, guess what? We'll store it on HDFS. So we'll use HDFS to store the actual data, but on top of HDFS, we'll add this extra relational database layer that makes this all look like a relational database seen from outside. And now you see that we've taken it to the next level because in the same way that on a single machine, the data is stored on the local drive, when on this cluster of machine, it's stored on the cluster drive. And what is the cluster drive? Well, that's HDFS. Right? And then you, you'll start to see why HDFS was designed in this way because you, you'll see that the the pieces are going to start assembled and maybe you're going to have a couple of aha moments, right? That suddenly you realize, oh, this is why HDFS is done that way, right? Because it's actually co-designed with HBase and we'll see also later with MapReduce. So this is what we look into today. This, we are going to use HDFS as a storage layer, but we are going to completely redesign a relational database management system on top of that. For the purpose of today, we are not going to nest anything uh, uh, in the data, it's really just tables with rows and columns. No XML, no JSON for this, uh, for this lecture. All right, so what's going to happen next? Well, what's going to happen next is that I'm going to keep taking the same approach that I've taken almost every week uh, now. Um, I'm going to start with the logical model of the uh, HBase. Just like we did, you know, for HDFS, I started with the logical model of HDFS. What is the logical model of HDFS? Well, we have a hierarchy of files and the files are made of blocks. That's the logical model. Then I showed you the implementation of HDFS and the implementation of HDFS, what with the name node, the data nodes, and so on and so on. That was the physical implementation. I nicely separated the two. Well, today I'm going to do exactly the same thing. I'm going to nicely separate the logical layer from the physical layer. So I'm going to start with the high level model. So this is what the user of HBase sees. And only later I'd show you the physical implementation what the user does not see, right? But it's useful to know how it's made just because it's interesting, right? Uh, okay. So what is the model here? Well, first I need to mention that the founding paper of that, uh, it also originates at Google, just like uh, GFS gave HGFS, which is the open source format. The original software, which is proprietary, is called Bigtable, a very original name. Uh, and uh, HBase is just the open source uh, version of that. That, that. that came later, but they are very, uh, very similar, right? Okay. So in order to motivate the model, why, why the model is that way? I mentioned earlier that we denormalize data. Right? But we are also going to denormalize data today. Maybe not all the way to the first no down the first normal form, but at least go down the normal forms. Why? Um, you might remember or know that uh, there is something in the relational database management system that is expensive, and that's join. When you have a table and another table and you want to join them, so this is basically what the join does, right? You want to join on these columns, for example. So you want to put that and that together, this and this, the three with, oh, there is no three the four with the four, the four with the four, there is no five here, and the six with the six, that is a join. You see the spaghetti right there, it's very costly. We'll keep seeing more spaghetti in that lecture, by the way, we, we will see in MapReduce and so on, but basically we don't like spaghetti in, uh, in, uh, in uh, well, I love spaghetti, I love to eat spaghetti, but not for big data. 
in big data, we love when things are nicely linear and, 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 and scaled, but this is not linear. This is what computer scientists would call quadratic, right? Um, so we don't like that. We don't like spaghetti and we try to keep it uh, to, uh, to a minimum. Um, so how do we get rid of that spaghetti to not have this problem? Because as you can imagine, if that's already expensive on one machine, can you imagine how expensive it's going to be if we have hundreds of billions of, uh, of uh, rows, right? So we want to avoid that. So we saw that um, in order to, to solve the, the thing, we, to avoid the, the huge spaghetti, we need to store together what is accessed together. We need to basically store this with this, store this with this, store this with this, right? If it's already stored together, then we don't have this huge spaghetti that's going to happen. And you might remember I, in, the, in the first week of the lecture, I told you about normal forms. And in particular, that normal forms means you nicely design separate tables, one table for everything you need. So this is the list of cities. This is a list of students and so on. And when you do that, there is a formalism for that that is taught in information systems for engineers. That is the normal form, the voice code normal form. If we drop that normal form, this is the sort of thing we, we get. We get a single table, which is put them together, but then we have undesirable dependencies in there. So we, we called them undesirable, right? Back then, information systems for engineers. But now think of it the other way around. If we have these two tables, we need to join them. If we bring back that once undesirable dependency right there, we no longer need to do the join. So you see, it's a compromise. Either I have my super nice uh, normal form nicely separated and I don't have undesirable dependencies, or I don't have to join. But you cannot uh, have the pie and eat it, right? It's either or. So what we are doing in big data is that we are giving up on the normal form. We are denormalizing. We say, okay, that's fine. Uh, it's okay if we have these undesirable functional dependencies. That's fine. Why? Because look, there is no join to be done. There's only one table here, right? Um, so what we do is that instead of having two tables, we just pre-join them. And that's actually the same. You can remember pre-computing a join is pretty much a way of denormalizing as well, right? It's just that we do not push the denormalization all the way to nested tables, right? That would be really the, the extreme of denormalization is nested tables with X and adjacent. Here, I only denormalize. I still have a table at the end, right? Still uh, uh, atomic values in there, but I still pre-computed the join like this. So I have a single big table. It's a bit ugly. It has a few dependencies here and there, but at least there is no join anymore. The, you see the spaghetti is gone. It's completely gone, right? Uh, but of course I might have duplicates, you, you see, because maybe here and here it's twice the same thing, right? So you see it's a bit inefficient, but that's okay. It's okay that it's inefficient because that way we don't have to compute the join anymore. And, and we like that. All right. So. This is the main motivation for the scaling of the table and the fact that now we are going to have a lot of columns if we pre-join the tables, right? And we can even go to millions of columns if we want. Right. All right, so what's the model? The model is actually relatively simple, just slightly uh, an enhancement of the relational uh, uh, database model. So the first thing is that one of the columns is special. That column is called the row ID, the identifier of the row. Uh, what is in there is pretty much anything really, uh, but it must be unique to each row. That's actually a primary key. But the difference with the relational database is that it's only one column in the case of HBase. Right? It's only one column. And that column has the identifier. For example, if this is a database of people, that would be the AHAFA number right? that, that identifies people. So you see, that's kind of the key value model, right? Where the key is the row ID and the value is all the rest, right? So it looks like the key value model, right? One more thing is that this is sorted, right? I keep that sorted, but in increasing, you see zero, zero, one, two, four, and so on. So it's increasing, all sorted. Second, the columns are actually not just a flat list of columns. They are organized in families. In a way, it's a little bit like namespaces, but don't worry, I'm not throwing back namespaces in there, right? But you could view them as column namespaces if you want to, to do the analogy with XML. This is called the colon family. Here I'm using color, colors, right? So there's the blue colon family, the yellow colon family, and the, the, the red colon family. This is called the colon family. Where do I get my colon families from? Well, typically this is when we normalize the data. 
that typically what comes from here might be a first colon family and what is in here is going to be a second colon family. So this is where that actually comes from. Uh, and typically it really means that maybe this is some math, maybe this is some music, you know, I'm just using the same analogy with namespace. This is just semantically this belongs together, right? Uh, within the same colon family. Now, what is really, really new to HBase or Bigtable or this new technology is that while the database is being run and people insert and modify and update and so on, columns can be added and removed on the fly, just like that. This is something that would be insane with a relational database management system. You, you cannot do that so easily, right? So if, if you use PostgreSQL or MySQL and so on, you cannot just, just like that add columns. If you want to add a column, you can, but it's a very heavy thing to do, right? Because you, you need to uh, issue a special SQL command like uh, alter table, create column, blah, blah, blah. And then it needs to spend time to add the column to every row and so on and so on. And you need to wait a bit, right? But in HBase, we can do that just like that on the fly. Right? So columns come and go. The one thing you cannot do on the fly is the column families. The column families must be defined in advance or you can add them, but it's heavy. So the column families test. But on the fly, you can just create columns as you see fit. And this is a, there's nothing to write home about basically. It just um, doesn't make it slower in any way. And in fact, there's going to be a lot of empty cells in there. So for example, how do I create a new column when it's just because I inserted a new record that now has a value for C. What happens to the others? They are just missing the value for C, right? But on the logical level, it's as if they had the column C, but it's empty, right? So that's why we create columns on the fly, right? So column families known in advance, it would be complex to add or remove them, but columns, Uncomplete yet. You can just add them and remove them as you go uh, on the fly. Okay, so this is the data model, right? So we have rows, we have columns, we have the row ID in increasing number, we have the column families, and we have the columns. Any questions so far? Um, yes, there is in the chat. Uh, the first question is that uh, if the row ID is sorted, uh, that means we have to sort any time we insert a new row in the table? You're absolutely correct. But the reason I'm not answering that right now is that this is only the logical model. So basically I don't even care yet how it's implemented. But I will spend a lot of time this week and next week explaining to you how that order is actually uh, maintained and, and uh, how this is done. We will spend more than an hour explaining that, right? It's just that, Right now, all I described is the logical model, what, what the user sees, right? So I'm basically postponing the answer to that question to, uh, to uh, uh, in a few minutes or next week, uh, right? The second question is that in SQL, we don't have an ordering of the attributes. Do we have ordering in HBase? Uh, I think we don't. I think we also don't. You might have just like in SQL, some kind of natural order that the database I mean, let me put it this way. Um, if I really wanted to annoy people, what I would do is implement a relational database. And every time you do a query, it shuffles the columns just because I can. That would be very annoying, wouldn't it? But I can do that because of course the order doesn't matter. But in practice, to not annoy people, the, the, the database system still try to kind of preserve a little bit the order in some way, even though it, it, it's normally irrelevant. Uh, it's, it's the same in, in HBase, right? So it's, there is probably a natural order, probably alphabetical or something, um, but, uh, but technically it's, uh, it, it, the, the order of the columns and of the column families is not important, right? Did I answer your question? Yeah, all right. Any There's questions? also a comment yeah. in the chat. So uh, the students is saying you use a time step in a row ID for ordering, I think. Uh, there is the notion of timestamp. You could, so let's put it that way. You could use a timestamp to do that. If, if basically you insert data as a log, for example, and then the timestamp is basically your key, uh, but it can be something else. As I said, for people, it can be the aha file number. 
um, and and uh, the, the, you still have timestamps, but they are hidden. I'll, I'll actually show you the timestamps. They are just not part of the logical model. Did I answer your question, this one? Yeah, wonderful. Okay, no more questions? Okay, so let's continue then. I'm done with the model. Now I'm going to show you how you query. So what it's still part of the logical layer, but it's the querying layer. How do you interact with HBase? So these are the primary queries. Well, there's four ways to the, the primitives of interaction. What you will immediately notice is that it's less high level than SQL. We, we don't have SQL just yet. It, it can be added later. Right now, we just have a low level way with four primitives to access the system. The first primitive is get. Actually, it should remind you of the object storage, you know, and, and rest and uh, this sort of APIs. But we have get. What is get? Well, get is okay. I'm giving you the row ID. Please get me the data and you receive that. Right. Or you can say, okay, get me the row for this ID and then you get that. Right. So this is get. The second one is put. Put it's the opposite. It's now please insert that new record. So now you're saying, okay, I want to insert the new record with that row ID and this is the data that should go in there. Right. This is called put. And now, of course, I'm keeping for later your question. That's a very good question. How do you preserve the order in there? Right. And I'll show you later how this is done on the physical level. But technically, on the logical level, we insert it, uh, this tuple where it belongs according to the order. So get, put, scan. Scan means that we, we are going to go through top down the entire table. So I'm, I'm starting there and then I'm going down the table like this. This is called a scan. Uh, and uh, what it does is that you basically give, give for example, a, a specific column family, or maybe you can also give a specific interval here of row ID, and you're just scanning your way through the, uh, the row ID and for the specific column family. So basically the input of that is the interval you want here, the column families you're interested in, and then you are going to get uh, to, to, to scan through the data in a streaming fashion. It's basically just like, like Netflix, right? It just streams over, but instead of a movie, it's just streaming data, right? So you're just scanning through the, um, the database. All right. And finally, the fourth one is delete. Delete is okay, please delete, it was 204. Delete uh, all the data related to row ID 204. And that, that just deletes it, right? So it's very easy. On the primitive level, it has get, put, scan, and delete, and that's all there is. And then of course you can start implementing stuff on top and people actually did implement SQL uh, uh, features on top of, 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 of HBase, right? But this is pretty much it. Um, and finally, to conclude my logical level, uh, what I call the key value model, we see it all the time, the key value model. Where did we see it? We saw it in Amazon S3, right? Where this was the bucket plus object IDs. This was already a key value model. Uh, where did we see it? We saw it in JSON. A JSON object has the key value model. We saw it for XML attributes within one element. The attributes also follow the key value model. Well, here too, we have a key value model where this is the row ID is the key and the rest of the columns are the value. So you see the key value model is everywhere. It's really an abstract concept that you find kind of everywhere. There is another term that you might see. It's column oriented storage or column stores you, you might have heard of. What is column stores? Well, it's just a specific implementation of a relational database that store tables, except that the way data is stored on the disk physically is column by column. By column. This is stored together on the disk, and this is stored together on the disk. So this is called column stores or column oriented storage. That's not what we are doing now. We are not doing column oriented storage, right? But just if you hear column stores, that's not exactly the same thing. What we do today is wide column stores, and this wide, refers to the colon family, the fact that we have colon families like this, and this is really uh, an enormous number of columns. So these are white colon stores is the proper generic name for big table, HBase, Cassandra also. So you see there's plenty of, uh, of technologies that, uh, that, uh, that kind of do that. Of course, it's just like between S3 and blobs, Azure Blob Storage or between HDFS and GFS, well, between HBase, Bigtable, Cassandra, there's also going to be a few differences, right? But 
the high level principles are very similar. And if you want to start using a different one, so we are going to learn HBase, right? But if later you work at Google and start using Bigtable, if it still exists, or maybe some newer technologies, uh, if you're at Facebook or Meta and use Cassandra and so on, uh, you just have to learn and read the documentation, but still already knowing HBase will make it easier because you already know the big principles that are behind that, right? Okay. So that was the logical level. You can see it's pretty simple, right? So an enormous table, row IDs, sorted, colon families, columns that can be created on the fly, a lot of columns, and I can get, put, scan, delete. Any questions so far? Um, yes, there's a student raised his hand. I was wondering what the um, output of the scan query is. Is it a Boolean value, whether a specific tuple is present or not, or is it more that it returns the tuple itself? Uh, on the logical level, it returns the tuple itself. Um, the, 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 the reason why the scan is a bit special is that although on the logical level, it looks like you're asking for an interval and bam, you get in one shot all the data, in reality, it's not going to happen like that. In reality, there will be this streaming thing that, that you, you, you basically go down the, uh, the table step by step. But this is something that we will look more into detail when we look at MapReduce, uh, Apache Spark, and so on. We'll see how that streaming actually happens. But on the logical level, the output of your scan is the data itself that is in there, right? You just need to have in mind that the way, the pattern that this is accessed is in a streaming fashion. All right. Thanks. You can use, by the way, uh, there is a shell uh, for, uh, for just like HDFS has a shell, HBase has a shell. And you can actually try uh, in the exercises the HBase shell and try to say get, put, scan, delete, try it. Uh, and, and you will see exactly what, what it looks like on your screen. Of course, if it's not too much data, it will be relatively fast. Uh, if it's more data, then of course uh, uh, it's, uh, it's different. So basically, let, let me also answer your question in a slightly different way. The scan can be a small or a big scan. If it's a small scan, then you will just see on your screen all the results of the scan. Maybe it's, you just needed 10 rows, for example. If you do a scan on like thousands of rows, then typically you will not display that on a screen. You will just write a program that streams through it and do something with it. Right. I'm not sure if that is clear. Yes, thank you. So do you have another question or on the Zoom chat? I saw a question in any case. Uh, yes, so we said that we work with tables with rows in order of several tens of billions. Uh, how many columns do we consider with each base in general? All right, so let me contrast that with a traditional relational database system. When you look at PostgreSQL or MySQL or any system that is on your laptop, sitting on your laptop, the number of columns um, goes between one and typically 255, 256, right? So the, the, the maximum number would be 256 and you cannot go beyond that, right? So, so this is just to see the restriction. Um, what HBase does is that it breaks that barrier. It, it's not limited to that. You can go all the way to actually millions uh, of columns. Um, in fact, you could even go, I'm going to be provocative, you can even have hundreds of billions of columns. But then you are going to think, okay, how is it even possible that I have enough data on earth in order to store hundreds of billions of rows and hundreds of billions of columns? Because you can try to compute the size of that, it's probably more than we have data on the planet, right? So how come we can have so many columns? That's because it's very sparse. A lot of the cells are empty. Right. So, so a lot of that is virtual. It's basically on the logical level, you have all these columns, but it's just because different toppers are not using the same columns. This, this is the secret and, and the reason why there are so many columns. Right. You just create them on the fly, just like that. Did I answer your question? Yeah. All right. Yes. Uh, another question is, yep. mm -hmm. uh, um, Joe's needs to be stored on the same machine, uh, so it can be too big. Uh, one row needs to be stored in the same machine. 
uh, content that is so big? Um, it's actually stored in HDFS. I will show you how. It's stored on HDFS. So the data is all sharded and spread over machines. I'll, I'll explain everything to you. It will become clear very, very soon. So uh, let, let's just say I postpone the answer to that question to what is to come now. Is it okay? All right, great. So it's going to start on thousands of machines. Yeah, let's say, okay. Uh, okay, now let's now dive into the physical story. That's actually starting to answer the, the, the last question. How do we store that? Because right now I just told you we have hundreds of billions of rows, we have millions of columns, but I didn't say where this is, how this is stored and so on and so on. So the first, automatic thought that you should have whenever you have something big to store is we need to shard it, partition, uh, split, chunk, block, whatever you call it. We, we need to shard it. How do we shard something like this? Well, we shard it in two ways. We shard it in both dimensions. We first shard it like this. It's like cutting a pie, right? It's a, it's a, it's a rectangle pie and you, you, you cut it like this and you cut it like that. So this is how it's done. We basically shard the, uh, the rows in what we call regions. A region is an interval of rows. The way we specify a region by convention is we specify the first row ID, including the first row ID included, and the first row ID excluded. It means we, we don't take the last one included, but the next one. Why? Because it's very convenient because this is also going to be the start of the next uh, region. So, so that's why we do it like that. For example, if you say it's between one and 10, then it's basically one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and not including 10. Right? That's the convention. Okay, so these are the regions. A region is just a horizontal slice. Oh, you see slice. I have yet another word for shard and split and plug and so on, it's slice. So I have a slice of my cake right there, a, a, a shard that's called a region. We are also going to shard like this. And here it's a very natural thing to do. How will I shard my columns? Well, by column families, of course. It, it, it's, slick out their hands, it's the obvious thing to do. So I'm going to shard like this and then like that and then like that. And now I have cut my pie into both dimensions, horizontally and vertically. This here is what we store together. So you see to answer your question, it's not the entire row. It's just this, the, the intersection of a column family and of a region, right? So th does it already answer your question that, that you just had? Yeah, wonderful. Okay, so now what does the architecture of the system look like? Well, this is like the dinner for one movie that a lot of uh, us look uh, every year on December 31st. If you haven't, then you should look at it. That's kind of uh, what we do at the end of the year. Um, we have uh, HDFS with the name node and the data node. It's a centralized architecture. Well, guess what? We also have a centralized architecture for HBase. So that's one less thing to learn, right? Well, the one thing you need to learn is the names. So uh, we don't call it name node. Of course, we call it HMaster for Hadoop. And these are region servers, right? So that's the name of the machines. But the one important thing is that here, these are the same machines. These are exactly the same machines, but each machine is both running the name. So here, the, the name node process for HDFS and the HMaster process for HBase, they are both running on that machine. Each one of these nodes right there runs both the data node process of HGFS and the region server process of HBase, right? But as an abuse of language, we still say the HMaster, the region server and so on to mean the machine, but actually we mean the process on the machine. All right, so let's start with the HMaster. What does it do? Well, it's similar to HDFS. So HDFS, the name node is responsible for high level operations, like for example, creating a directory, deleting a directory, and so on and so on. Well, here is the same thing. We can create a table, we can delete a table and so on. So this is the sort of things the HMaster can do. Um, something else that the HMaster does is it assigns regions to region servers. So for example, we have these hundreds of billions of rows. We are going to shard them by region like this. Only the, the regions, I'm not looking yet at the column families. So each region like this is assigned to one of the region servers. So this is, these are four region servers and you see they, they get uh, their regions that they are responsible of. 
And what I used here, the terminology responsible of is important. I didn't say they store the region. I said they are responsible of the region. That's not the same thing. It doesn't mean it, it's, um, I, I'm, I'm coming back to the storage later. Roughly, they also kind of store it, but we'll see that it's not a perfect match. So this is why I distinguish between being responsible of and actually storing. Right? So what they, they basically are responsible of answering requests. If somebody asks for values from that row, then it's this server right there that is responsible of giving an answer for that row. And then it's going to fetch the data wherever it is. Very often, it's also going to be on the same data node, but sometimes it might be somewhere else as well. Right. So this is why I distinguish responsible of, it's not the same thing as stores. Okay, so what happens in our system is that sometimes you might insert so much data at the same location that it starts to be too big. So here we have a very big region. What's going to happen is that spontaneously by itself, the region server is going to notice and say, oh, I should split that. And then it just splits it into two and just spontaneously. And then it has created one more region like that. The data is just uh, the same, but it's just split on the logical level. What can then happen is that then we notice there is an imbalance. This server here, the region server is responsible for three regions and this one only for one. So the H master can see that and say, okay, there's too much work in there. Let's redistribute a little bit, right? So this is just a reassignment. The data doesn't move. So then the data will basically still be here, but the responsibility moves to this server right there. So we spread the workload a little, right? And what happens if this machine crashes because it happens from time to time? No problem because it's stored in HDFS anyway. So it's replicated. We just need to reassign the responsibilities, right? So this region is just reassigned to this one and this region to this one, right? So this is how it works. And again, this is why it's so important to distinguish between being responsible for a region and storing a region. These are two different things, right? Okay. And now what the region servers do is that they manage their region. So, so let's take, for example, uh, a reminder that on the logical level, we sharded like this and like that. The unit of storage is the intersection of a column family and a region. So what does it mean? Let's take an example of a region server that is responsible for a specific region. For example, this one. It means that the region server is going to handle the data in these three stores, in these three uh, units of storage, right? It's responsible for it. But on the physical level below, this will be stored at one place. This will be stored differently at another place. And this will be stored at another place, right? So this is how we shard the cake uh, horizontally and vertically, right? So again, we have one region here one column family here that's the unit of storage and within that unit of storage we have the cells each cell is for one row id and one column i have a value in there whatever that is large or small there, there's a value in there and now we are going to store all of the cells that belong to that store right we are going to store it how well we'll see next week because now is actually the time to go and get some lunch uh, so I'll come back to it next week of all the details of how that uh, is actually going to end up as files on HDFS. Before we go, I would still like to make sure that you followed what I've actually been telling you, and then you'll be good to go. All right, so we still majority above 80, that's perfect. And I totally expected that now it shifts a bit down to uh, some that understood a bit more than half. It's totally normal. Uh, the namespaces were a bit tough, I know, and, uh, and the edge base is also uh, a bit complex. So uh, don't worry about that. Take the time to study offline, ask questions on Mattermost. We are here to help you. Uh, and that's basically it. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Wenshi, for moderating the lecture and uh, enjoy your meal.